Uh, so when Lee asked me to give a talk, I hadn't looked at the brochure, uh, the program. And then I looked at the program about neuroscience. My talk was about cancer. So he said, well, why don't you talk about the brain? So I've, cha I've changed it to, uh, what, what I want to go through is a number of assays that we can do, in the, particularly the human brain, but we can do it in different animals, of uh, biochemistry and neurochemistry, to show you what we can contribute to all the other sciences uh, that, that take on issues in the brain. Um, so uh, what is PET? It's a molecular camera. Uh, we use tracers. Uh, we label molecules and do assays. We can do KDs or Bmaxes. We can do enzyme kinetics. We can do many different things because we actually measure the kinetics of the probe uh, over time. It's quantitative throughout all tissues of the body. Now, I want to just point out several things and not go through all this, but the amount that we inject is about is nanomolar amounts, so really no mass effects in the body, and that has two major implications. One, the Heisenberg principle, that we don't cause mass perturbations on the system, and the second one is the FDA perturbation. We don't cause effects on them uh, because there are no mass effects. Now, that gives us uh, actually a fairly quick way to get into humans. In fact, most medical schools have a local committee, FDA sanctioned for pet tracers. So we can do very quickly 30 studies to see whether we go or we don't go. <clears throat> the, there are about 37 million clinical pet studies done so far without one reported complication. Now, that's all around the mass issue that they're a mass effect. <clears throat> the, and we can go down to concentrations around picomoles per gram, actually lower than that. So uh, the technique itself had very high sensitivity, about 10 to 11 higher than MRI. Now, there are limitations also in PET. And one of the limitations is one at a time. We can make only one assay at a time. We can't multiplex. <clears throat> um, so... We need to get to the right rate controlling target uh, through other science that's done, and then be able to bring that forward in many different conditions. <clears throat> oh, uh, one thing I just, there are about 3,000 pet probes have been developed over the years, and you can see the different types of assays that we can do in vivo, whether it's a mouse or a patient, all those done in patients. And it used to be that there were no commercial companies for pet probes. Over the last eight years, there are now 12 of them, large corporations and, and smaller ones as well. <clears throat> so here are the clinical pet centers in America. Um, <clears throat> there are about 2,400 of them. When you were sleeping at night, we were building these damn things and distributed them all over the world, in fact. Most all countries have clinical pet centers. Um, and there are about four or five million clinical pet studies done every year. But beyond that, all these pet centers in America were connected in a network. And initially, that was a contract that we wrote with Medicare and Medicaid to, provide, to do with evidence-based approval on reimbursement. But then it became uh, a trial for drug studies or probes that's all built through that. And by the way, Medicare paid for it. And, and there are now 300,000 patients in that trial with pet studies. So that gives us uh, flexibility uh, for going and doing our clinical trials. <clears throat> um, the approvals are cancer, Alzheimer's, Parkinson, epilepsy, coronary artery disease. There are about 600 preclinical centers as well. <clears throat> now, the process we go through is many different molecular probe categories or classes. Um, <clears throat> the, and this is where we spend the bulk of the time in vitro, trying to get the biology of disease right, trying to identify the rate controlling proteins or particularly enzymes, and then move to develop probes for that. So we do a lot, we have a lot of relationships with people about the biology of disease, including ISB. <clears throat> and we go through a lot of differential screens to get to a pathway and a rate controlling uh, uh, 
target in that, and I'll go through some examples. And then we'll go in vivo in many different mouse models. Uh, this is, there's a declarative statement in the first slide. I'm one of the founders of that company. Jim is also part of that company. We used to put that as a conflict of interest statement. Now it's part of our marketing. <coughs> Um, so from these in vivo studies, many different mouse models, of course, we can go fairly quickly into PET studies. And most all clinical PET scanners are PET CT now. They're integrated systems. Now Siemens and Philips have also released PET MRI uh, scanners. And then into patients through that whole process. Now, <clears throat> in imaging probes and drugs, it's very important that we can get to the patient quickly. Because the problem we're trying to optimize is part in cell culture, part in mouse models, and part in patients, and use all of that. Not to optimize or spend our life in any one of those things. So it's important that we can get quickly to the patient and then come back, and, we, and most often we do, come back into the basic science to answer questions that arise in patients. <clears throat> now, um, Jim is right. I, I don't like complexity. I like diversity. I'm not sure it's very meaningful, but I like simple things. And I want to kind of separate the body's biology in simple categories. Um, homostasis, uh, it's broadly distributed, highly regulated, and very stable. It was designed survival at all costs. Many enzymes, high ATP consumption, lots of feudal cycles, lots of redundancy, lots of compensatory responses and reserves and so forth. Then over here, <clears throat> there are switches that will switch from homostasis over into a demand or command to make a change. Now, I'm going to show you some of those, but they tend to be local, fast responses, few enzymes, low ATP consumption, and they control and drive transitions of phenotypes to new sets of instructions, whether they're normal or diseased. So I'm going to stay over here. At my age, most of what I know about those processes, I learned in homostasis. But it's not true over there, or it's different there. <clears throat> so one switch you're familiar with here is a switch from oxidative phosphorylation, internal combustion, <clears throat> that burns glucose down to um, CO2 and water. And I'm going to talk a little more stoichiometrically about that in a minute. And then a switch over to aerobic, not anaerobic, but aerobic glycolysis, where now this is a minor pathway. The hexose monophosphate shunt is activated, so glucose will supply all of these favored over just oxidative respiration. Now, that occurs in activated neurons. I'm going to show you that. Uh, activation of the immune system. Uh, malignant transformation, of course, the famous Warburg effect, and embryonic cells. <clears throat> now, another switch is a switch from the de novo DNA synthesis pathway to the salvage pathway. Now, if you look at these two pathways, de novo <coughs> uh, consumes six moles of ATP per mole of uh, nucleotide produced. 37 enzymes in that pathway, well-regulated and well-controlled. The salvage pathway, on the other hand, one mole of ATP per mole of nucleotide, there are only three enzymes, and there's only one rate-controlling one, DCK. Now, <clears throat> so this, you know, is a very stable, highly regulated system. This one is very action-oriented for highly dividing cells. <clears throat> and... So this also illustrates the thing we have to go through to make things simple enough that PET can be valuable. <clears throat> so enormous effort went into identifying the DCK as the regulatory enzyme for that pathway. Um, now, there are $3 billion a year of drugs that target that pathway, uh, pro-drugs. <clears throat> there are almost 1,000 open trials, and they're all in cancer, that target that, drug, that uh, DCK as well. <clears throat> and if you go across all diseases and all drugs, on average, only 20% of patients respond to a drug. 
80% of patients bear the risk with no benefit, enormous resource a lot. Now, it's never going to be 100%, but that's not good. So we developed an assay for DCK that we apply in patients. We're in phase one trials to that, but enormous studies in the basic science before we ever got to that point. So those are two switches. Switching in glycolysis, switching from oxyphosphorylation to glycolysis, switching from de novo over to an action oriented salvage DNA pathway, demand and command. <clears throat> so uh, this is a study, I want, there are three slides here. Uh, it's an example of where things begin in a very acceptable way to everybody and then you get in a lot of trouble. So these are studies that at the time my student John Mazziota and I did where we took uh, a group of normal people in Southern California well, I mean, at least in Southern California, they were not. <laughs> so we had them do simple tasks. Now, remember the brain, 95% of the energy for the brain to function comes from glucose. So these are images of glycolysis with that probe, FDG. <clears throat> so the color scale is in proportion to the glycolytic rate. So, and these are cross sections, front to back and, and left to right. So very, very simple visual stimulation. Uh, activate the visual cortex. Um, of course, when it becomes more complex, it'll go out into the association visual cortex in many areas, in fact. <clears throat> Here we did an auditory stimulation. Uh, this is a mystery story, The Shadow. How many people know The Shadow? What was his name? Lamont Crimson. Lamont Crimson. And my wife loves this part. The shadows is only the, e the evil that lurks in the hearts of men. The evil, the, the shadow knows the evil that lurks in the hearts of men. The shadow knows. Yeah. 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 Let me tell you, all the women know too. So uh, this, this uh, mystery uh, story has the Brandenburg Concertos in the foreground, the language. So language activating the left auditory cortex, music the right. Now, we did hemispheric specialization, lateralization, many different things beyond this. We had people count backwards from 100 by 7s. We said the faster you do it, the more accurate you do it, the more we'll pay you. You can't do that anymore, by the way. And so that would activate the frontal cortex, a simple memory recall task, activating the hippocampus, and then touching your thumb to your fingers. On your right hand, activating the left hand. Now, <clears throat> this caused enormous things to happen. The Neurological Institute, uh, the director of that time was a biochemist. He was amazed. No one had ever been able to look at the biochemistry in the human brain. Donald Tower. <clears throat> Within three months, he issued an RFA to set up six neuroscience pet centers to explore this. And because glucose is the primary substrate, we were fine. <clears throat> oh, sorry. Now, if we look at um, the brain, the brain's unusual, and it's only about 3% of the weight, although that percent's been dropping in recent decades by the rest of the body. But it consumes 20% of the oxygen of the body. So it has very high oxygen demands at rest. And good part is an inhibitory organ. So it goes up to power and puts on the brakes. If it has to do something, boy, it doesn't have to build power. It just goes. Um, and if you look at the stoichiometry, uh, 5.7 moles of oxygen are used per mole of glucose. So it's pretty close to the ratio of 6 for full combustion of CO2 and water. <clears throat> now... That's the condition at rest, whatever that means with the brain. But, but what happens when you take an action? <clears throat> oh, God, sorry. So these are studies actually done by Mark Rakel at Washington U. So these, this is a very simple visual scene, activating the visual cortex, <clears throat> uh, measuring now images that are the difference between activation and rest. Isolating what happened 
by activation of the visual scene. So these are quantitative measurements in real scientific units to stoichiometrically balance these different processes. So we see <clears throat> in blood flow, and this is really capillary blood flow, nutrient blood flow, you see there's an increase in the visual cortex by the visual stimulation. You see glucose metabolism increased, as we'd seen before, but oxygen metabolism did not increase. That wasn't a limitation in oxygen availability. There's lots of oxygen. And that's measured by the product of the capillary perfusion times extraction fraction of oxygen in tissue. So there's lots of oxygen, but it, it chooses to switch its mechanism by which it will take action. Now, there are many of these switches around the biology of the body. And, and they, they're the ones that are really important to us because they're ones that transition to activity, to disease, and they're simpler. <clears throat> and you see the analytical results. Now, this became very controversial because everybody said, well, <laughs> that's not true. We all know the stoichiometric relationship between glucose and oxygen in the brain. Now, that came out of 30 years of measuring the AB difference across the whole brain. In fact, in those kind of studies, measuring the blood flow and oxygen metabolism, glucose metabolism, they could do all kinds of stimulations and nothing would change. Seizures were the only thing they could see change because they were local and not uh, seen by global measurements. Now, <clears throat> there <clears throat> are many different probes in PET for almost all the neurotransmitter systems in the brain in most of the subtypes. Now, this is just the dopaminergic system to be able to look at the different regulatory components of neurotransmission, but in people and in patients. <clears throat> um, but I'm going to concentrate on these two. So a probe to assay dopamine synthesis uh, in the basal ganglia, and then a probe, uh, Depernil, to, to do an assay of monamine oxidase B. So we'll just focus on that portion. But you see the way that within certain restrictions, you have many different ways to go into people and patients and look at the look at the components of how the system functions at a molecular level. But we need the basic sciences to say, here's, here's, how, here's how you do it and how you start. <clears throat> so at one time, we had a, a very large rhesus monkey colony at uh, UCLA. <clears throat> and we were studying cocaine methamphetamine abuse in, in people. But people are really hard to control uh, on their doses, in particular their abstinence. Not very trustworthy. But monkeys, we could control them. Um, so here are two curves where we're measuring uh, the, the impact of methamphetamine on doping synthesis in the brain. So from the normal to down to one week, of daily doses of high cocaine human abuse level. A dramatic reduction in dopamine synthesis. Cut that dose in half, uh, the deficit is about cut in half. But the surprising part is here. And you see in the images the control um, one month after, um, and that's three weeks after we've stopped, and then six months and so forth. This was surprising and this was occurring when people were using stop drugs and put an egg on a frying pan and it fries your brain. And they said, just get over it, man. And the thing was surprised how long it took to get over it. This is a developmental response. And in fact, when we went down to the very elementary says so all the way back to the genome, we could show that to get over it, you had to go back to the genome and reconstitute a developmental response. Not so simple to get over it. <clears throat> now, um, this is actually a study that we did some time ago when people were doing fetal tissue transplants, uh, both here and mainly in Sweden. So uh, these are Parkinson's patients. Uh, a normal subject with dopamine sensitive caudate and the putamen. 
a Parkinson's patient with bilateral deficits in dopamine synthesis, and an idiopathic Parkinson, it's not in the cauda, it's only in the patina. <clears throat> and then um, a unilateral fetal tissue transplant. Now, here's the bottom line on this. Um, if patients eventually improved symptomatically, uh, that was always associated with a restoration of dopamine synthesis. And in fact, the dopamine synthesis would occur before they'd improve, and then they would later improve. If that didn't occur, they never improved. But the problem was that, <clears throat> well, there were many problems, but one of the problems was there were massive amounts of fetal tissue were selectively cut into the, into the striatum. And, <clears throat> and the cells had to first survive an environment that was injured and hypoxic. And most of the cells did not even survive that. <clears throat> so the, you know, if stem cells come back, or come, not come back, but come into this problem once again, in many different ways they are, we will come back and help them and their patients. Now, we can do the assays like that. We can measure gene expression in people, which we do. So we can put reported genes into the cells, and then we can measure whether they're being expressed in the patient and whether the biochemical outcomes. Now, <clears throat> interestingly, with these very severe deficits, they have, no old, they have no growth structural change in MRI. And when you look at glucose metabolism, that's very sensitive to many different diseases, I'll show you. Um, there's actually an increase in the putamen, but it's like 10%. But when you go over to the process of Parkinson's, dopamine, then it's dramatic. So you got to get the right process and the right probe. Now, monamine oxidase is one of the regulators of the, in, the do, in the cleft. It will run down the uh, amount of dopamine in the cleft by oxidizing it. And Joanna Fell at Brookhaven developed a label version of this drug, Depernil, that's used for depression. Elevate your mood by elevating dopamine. And they ran into a problem when they did the first normals. They were expecting a normal distribution, and it was bimodal. And a factor of two different between the two peaks. And <clears throat> when they looked through the volunteers, some smoked and some didn't smoke. So then they set upon a course to examine the <clears throat> impact of smoking on monamine oxidase. So you can see these different levels in the brain around the basal ganglion and down the cerebellum um, of non-smokers and smokers. There's a dramatic reduction in monamine oxidase, which if you like to get high, that's actually good because it raises, I have three minutes. <clears throat> um, so they clearly showed that smoking produced a reduction in monamine, monamine oxidase enzyme activity in comparable to the blocking down with, with Depernil as a drug. They did whole body, well, here's the, the plot of the data. They also showed that people that went into absence for two or more years would actually restore uh, their monamine oxidase. They did whole body studies and showed that monamine oxidase and smokers are reduced throughout your body in many different organ systems. <clears throat> now, I'm going to have to move very quickly. So this, we're back to glucose metabolism, normal age match people. Uh, this is high in the brain around the intercerebral folds, uh, down around the mid-level brain, the basal ganglion. In the mild cognitive impairment, you see metabolic decreases here in the, in the posterior cingulate and the parietal cortex. But what you see over time is <clears throat> a spreading of the deficit throughout the brain, while, of course, the patient's functions are decreasing progressively. When you get to late stage uh, Alzheimer's, they look very similar to the metabolic distribution in a six-year-old. In fact, if you go up to a late stage Alzheimer's patient and run your finger by their mouth, they'll turn and suck on your finger. It's a pathologic return of the moral sucking response. Children, of course, grow out of that, and they're just stuck with it. Now, we had shown that we could identify Alzheimer's uh, with a 93% accuracy three years before the clinical diagnosis of probable Alzheimer's means probably. 
And then uh, John and I said, well, can we, det- can we det- detect asymptomatic disease? You know, medicine lives on the start to the end of life and disease in a little tiny portion. There are many compensatory responses. So we took on Huntington's disease. We had shown our metabolic deficits in narcotic and pitamin symptomatically. And we spent 15 years studying asymptomatic patients with Huntington's, a dominant hereditary disease with total penetration. And <clears throat> there were patients that had normal studies, and there were patients that had severe reductions in metabolism in the cauda and pitamin, but no symptoms. Now, at the time we did this study, Gazella came out with the G4 marker, and 70% of our predictions agreed with him. And, and everybody said, well, it's a genetic marker, genetic disease, the pet is wrong. And I agreed with that. But it turned out the marker was wrong. <clears throat> and eventually, of course, they went to the gene and so forth. And an amazing thing that never happens in clinical studies, there was 100% predictability. And the asymptomatic patients of who carried the gene by the expression of the effect, not looking at the gene. <clears throat> um, we also, so it, we showed and published that we could identify those changes seven years before symptoms. Uh, we did that in Alzheimer's uh, as well, five to eight years before a symptom. Now, <clears throat> the, this is the last, this is the last, I have two slides, and I'll do them really quick. <clears throat> but, you know, moving into asymptomatic diseases, you know, it was, amazing to us the profound changes with no symptoms. On the other hand, 70 to 80% of the neurons in the Niagara are gone before Parkinson's patients had it. There are many, many compensatory responses that can occur, and until they're overridden, we don't have symptoms. But the disease has been going on for a long time. <clears throat> now, another one of uh, my students, Harry Chigani, pediatric neurologist, we were studying many different childhood disorders, but out of that population, we had uh, metabolic data on the cortex uh, as a function of age. And at, <clears throat> uh, after birth, the metabolic rate's about half the adult value, but rapidly rises up to the adult value and into twice that value, and then declines over the second decade of life. Now, at this time, this also is very controversial. <clears throat> um, then Huntlocker in Chicago published the um, <clears throat> process density from autopsies in children. And it mapped over this completely, although it was starting a little bit earlier. But what, what was shown by that is that birth, very sparse connections. Of course, the number of neurons are constant. And during this period, there are twice as many connections. And then half of them are killed and pruned out. So. The ones that retained are repetitious activities uh, to the synapse to fix and stay. And if not, they're eliminated. Now, there are orders of magnitude more flexibility because the processes and axons can move around and test many connections. <clears throat> and you see the imaging results of that. We went in and did that on cats. But my last slide shows more than you should ever ask of any child to learn to do. Now, these are refractory neonatal seizures. These kids develop normally. Then they start having seizures that we cannot control by anticonvulsants. And they're having 50 to 100 seizures a day. And they start to degenerate. They're dealing with seizures, anticonvulsants, or anesthetics, and they're struggling. And they, they start to deteriorate mentally and physically, and they die in their late teens. So. We knew from the element, from the basic sciences that the brain could reorganize during this period. But very boldly, the pediatric neurosurgeon and the, pedi- and the pediatric neurologist, and quite frankly, a mother, uh, when we started with Brandy, um, here, I can't see this as well, but Brandy's brain from high down to mid, down cerebellum, is a severe metabolic deficit throughout her entire left cortex in a contralateral diaschesis that you can see here. Uh, Her MRIs are completely normal, but uh, the pediatric neurosurgeon decided to do a hemispherectomy. Now, not really a hemidecortication, 
So here you see post-op, <clears throat> brain has got one hemisphere. These dots are from the MRI. We, l we left the uh, subcortical structures on the contralateral side. And the diastasis is worse because we removed that hemisphere. <clears throat> By two and a half years, this hemisphere has picked up the contralateral subcortical system. The diastasis is pretty much resolved. And Brandy has minor deficits in her fingers. Uh, <clears throat> this is the left hemisphere. She talks fine. She walks fine. She's a beautiful young girl. There are 270 children that we did this to. But in the beginning, this was really hard uh, to believe that they could compensate. Now, we also did much more detailed studies on kittens to cats uh, to show that this single hemisphere, now there are cross connections. So, that, <clears throat> so the side that this hemisphere normally took care of, this one, through the connections, cross connects, could now take care of both sides of the brain. I'm done. <laughs>